welcome everyone. Thank you for um, attending our Ask the Expert series. Uh, this is going to be, um, do you know how to tame risk or will it bite you? I'd like to welcome our special guest, Dr. Brian Hagen, who's the founder and director of the Decision of Empowerment Institute. My name is Jen Bardsley, and I'll be serving um, as a moderator for today's webinar. I currently um, serve as the account manager for the Winshire Group. So during our uh, time together, uh, our panelists will provide their experience and insights on risk and cover some common questions for leaders and executives that cover you know, which problems, which risks, which opportunities. So please feel free to submit your questions uh, throughout the presentation. There's a Q&A button um, along the bottom that you can just push and, and submit them. And we will um, we'll go over them at the end of the presentation. Um, but at this time, I would um, like to introduce you to one of our panelists, uh, Dr. James Blackwell. Uh, Dr. Blackwell is the president and principal consultant for the Winshire Group, which is founded in 2011. Uh, the Winshire Group accelerates development and manufacturing for commercialization, th commercialization therapies, provides quality expertise. Uh, Dr. Blackwell has been a leading industry consultant for more than 15 years. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to um, turn this presentation over to Dr. Blackwell. Thanks, Jen, and thanks uh, for our attendees for coming. I think uh, you're really going to enjoy today's presentation, and you're going to hear from one of the leading experts in this uh, field. And one of the things I really appreciate about working with Brian is he uh, is someone who's been able to take the complex and simplify it and simplify it so that organizations and people can use um, the methodologies that he's that he's perfected. Um, and you can only do that if you have a very, very deep understanding of your field and know what's important and what is not. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Brian for self-introduction. Happy to be here. I'm Brian Hagen. I'm, uh, my background is in decision uh, risk analysis. Actually, my doctorate's in that field. And uh, I'm unique, I think, in the sense that I, I belong both in the analytics and rational thinking and mathematics and finance, but I also have a deep understanding of cognition and psychology and uh, the strengths of how we think about things and the limitations we have as well and the biases that come into it. And putting those two things together has enabled to put me to put together an analytics that's kind of a best fit for this type of a thing. Happy to be here again. Can't wait to get started. Yeah, I'd like to introduce uh, the topic today. So uh, one of the things that, that I'm fortunate as a consultant is I get to go into a lot of different organizations and see the issues and struggles that they have. And you know, from a very high level, I, I think the two most important areas where I see uh, organization structure is around their information management, starting really with uh, startup companies. You know, Using Box and dumping a bunch of documents uh, in it to prepare a BLA is, is very poor knowledge management. I see a lot of process data not being captured or kept in a compliant manner and disorganized SharePoint sites uh, with really no naming conventions or, or really good uh, structure to those kinds of sites. Um, and we'll, we'll be having a future webinar on this topic in the future, and uh, we're innovating here. We'll be offering some new uh, products and services to the industry uh, soon. Uh, Decision-making. This is really the topic of today's uh, organization. And you see uh, too many ad hoc decisions uh, being made and no rational basis or decision making tools being used um, and no consistent means to organize these things and really scan your internal environment or external environment and really help understand it. And uh, this really can get you in trouble. And I started my career with Genzyme. Uh, we all know about their consent decree and the troubles uh, we have. I know what happened there. I think, you know, had they been using uh, tools and risk-based tools, they could have headed that off and uh, if you look for Genzyme now in a commercial product, you, you can't find it. So uh, the, the organization was lost uh, because of those issues. Uh, and things around patient safety is always important to our industry. So um, when you think about opportunities, uh, there's always a risk of not taking advantage of them. And when you talk about risk, uh, they represent opportunities as well. And, and Brian will be talking about that um, as, as we go along. So anyhow, uh, really, 
uh, this is these are things are like brushing your teeth and flossing your teeth every day, right? Not everyone does it, and it can be difficult for for a lot of people. So um, all this means that there's lost productivity, um, poor uh, or less than optimal decision making. And so with that, I'd like to, uh, to turn it over to Brian. Thanks, James. Uh, a, a real important point James just made is this notion of ad hoc decision making, kind of shooting from the hip, thinking we have it all figured out. Um, and so if we're going to do anything that has any kind of analytics, it's got to be efficient. It's got to be fast. It's got to be right. Uh, it's got to be a lot of things to fit in to the pace that an organization makes decisions, okay? And that's what's behind uh, this particular approach that we're going to, going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to start from a, from a psychological perspective, and it's a notion that's called cognitive dissonance. You might have heard the term before. And, and that's a stress single signal that you get in your head. As an example, if you remember, if you procrastinated in, in university days, uh, you know, you had a term paper that was due Friday and it was Thursday evening. Okay, you had a really big stress signal in there. You had cognitive dissonance. There was two beliefs. One, you had to turn in a paper tomorrow. Two, you hadn't started on it yet. That disconnect creates stress and that's what creates all the decision-making uh, unless it's automated, that's what gets our attention and that's what we respond to. That's just the nature of who we are. So we need to understand that there's some good things about that and there's some bad things about that too. All right. Um, so I'm going to peel this back. After a lot of years of thinking about this, I did a lot of portfolio work, portfolio of R&D products, portfolio of, or network of uh, manufacturing sites, Portfolio of investments, how you, how you invest your personal money. Everything's a portfolio. And I would always make a different model, you know, for risks, for business, for strategy, all these things, I always made a different model. I said, gosh, there's gotta be some universal way to think about this. And what I realized after a lot of years is at the atomic level, decisions, there are only three things that we make decisions about or a combination of three things. We decide about how to resolve problems. We make decisions about how to mitigate risks. And we make decisions about how to capture opportunities. P for problems, R for risks, O for opportunities. I call that pro-management. And here's the difficulty that we have with this. If I walked into your office, if you keep things on a whiteboard, I'd probably, uh, anything that was a problem that you needed to be addressed likely is on the whiteboard. Big problems, small problems, all problems. We're problem solvers. We always, if there's a problem, we tend to go after that first. I'll go to opportunities next. Opportunities, there might be an opportunity or two on your whiteboard, um, but they take effort. You have to vet those. You have to sell the idea. It's hard to get the, harder to get the resources to fund an opportunity than to fix a problem. And in last place, what gets short shrift are risks. There's a good chance there are no risks written on your whiteboard. You're aware of them. Uh, and there's a cognitive reason for that too, that I'll get back to, but there's a blind spot, neurological blind spot we have for risks. So when we're asking for resources to do something, it's for one or a combination of these three things. And we tend to solve problems first. I'm gonna just call something the pro dilemma. Right now, if I asked you and said, this, just list your problems, risks, and opportunities. Just make a quick bullet list of your problems, risks, and opportunities. And you'll see there's far more on that list than you have resources to address. You'll have to make a decision on which of those to address. So the pro dilemma is which problems, risks, and opportunities. It's a prioritization problem. And that's the heart of executive management to me is solving, resolving the pro dilemma. And I think your job by and large is managing that pro portfolio. What's your pro items? Which one should you be managing now, putting resources against? To me, if I said, if I only had one line or a paragraph to write about executive management, I would say it's about managing your pro portfolio. So that's the fundamental uh, framework that we have. And we're gonna take that thought at this atomic level of decision-making and talk about 
now solving or resolving the pro dilemma. So who has the pro dilemma? What should I be focusing on? What has the most value? What's my, what's the best allocation of my resources right now, thinking about now and the future. And if you look down the list, it's everyone. Down at the bottom of my slide, anyone with a plan or budget, as soon as you approve a plan or a budget, you own a pro portfolio and you should be managing it. Even if you don't have a plan or budget, you've got a pro portfolio and you should be managing that. How do we do that for best value? How do we make sure we're doing the best for the enterprise? We work for the enterprise. We don't work for the department. We don't work for a function. We work for the enterprise. And in this case, our clients or patients. Sorry. So we need what I'll say a narrative-based approach. We think in terms of narratives. We think in terms of stories. This happens, then this happens. And everyone we engage with can always think in terms of narratives. So the analytics should be narrative-based, and these are. So we need narrative-based uh, process and tools to overcome what I'll call neurological blind spot to risks we have not personally experienced. Here's what happens. We can talk about risk, but if you've never experienced it and had to live through some uh, uh, a risk that has occurred, you don't have, your memory has no emotional memory to that situation. There's no tug to act on the risk because in your mind, it's probably not gonna happen. It just doesn't feel real. You don't get any cognitive dissonance for risks that you haven't experienced. And that's a big hole. We can't rely on our innate decision-making skills because they fall short in a corporation and they fall short in life now too. Life's much more complex. We need to manage risk and you can't just go by how you feel about it because you're gonna miss. Most of the time you'll be fine. Every now and then you're gonna get hammered. Okay, you're gonna, something happens and when you could have mitigated it, uh, then you're gonna live with the regret, okay? And that's a burden on yourself as well. So how do we get around this? Well, we need a simple way to determine you know, this best resource allocation. And here's a list of problems, risks, and opportunities. This isn't one client, it's actually across several clients and over years, but you're gonna see some usual type of uh, suspects in here. They're not ordered in any way stock out resulting from a delayed tech transfer. I'm gonna use this as an example. You're gonna tech transfer your product to a CMO and the CMO has done a lot of work for you and you don't have the best relationship and they've screwed some things up, but they're the best game in town still, okay? And so you're still transferring that and you're worried about a delayed tech transfer burning through your safety stock and suddenly you've got a stock out and in life sciences companies, that's a big deal. That, start losing revenue, that's gonna be a big deal. We'll talk about this in more detail. Hey, here's another one. You got a Six Sigma team, they've been looking at things and they said, hey, we can improve the clinical trial supply forecasting. Um, that's an opportunity, there's a way to do that. Each of these, someone's hands out, probably to the CFO saying, hey, we got something here, I need resources, it's not in my budget. Probably, it may not be in my budget. These are emerging things. It's Tuesday morning, get a call from the FDA. Toxa, toxa studies failed. We, oh, we're going to have to scramble. This is a problem. It's not a risk. It was a risk on Friday. Tuesday, you got the call and the letter from the FDA. You're going to have to scramble now. Oh, my goodness. There's going to be a delay in the launch of this product. Not good news. Nobody's happy. And there's a whole list of other things in here. Uh, another risk down here, clinical trial enrollment risk, a common thing. Just not getting the enrollments, not matching their schedule. Need, we've got a risk that this trial is going to run long. Uh, single source stock out risk. One more in here. Common thing. Hey, we want, we want, a double, we want another second source on all these things. Second sources cost money. Not all of them are worth the money. Sometimes, well, I'll talk more about this, you'll say I'm gonna get the second source anyways. But you ought to know if it's financially the thing that you should be doing right now, that's the buy. In competition for all these other things, because all these things require resources. 
how are you going to figure that out? You could just have a meeting and pound it out. You're going to make mistakes. We already know about the types of mistakes that you're going to make. We need something to level the playing field. So I'd say, short of what I'm going to talk about, there's no way to compare these requests for resources on a level playing field based on best value. That's what do I mean by best value? How do I go about that? Well, I'm going to say, as I always say, no matter what type of risk you talk about, it does show up in your cash flow eventually. If you miss, if you've got the product efficacy, if you've got a great product, you get more revenue. There's R&D investments that shows up in the cash flow. If you've got a product recall, there's penalties. You've got, you've got to go get the product. I mean, it's a mess. It's expensive and it probably hurts your future sales on top of it. Safety. Safety costs money too. Compliance costs money too. Are we low side compliant or should we go high side compliant here? There's degrees of being compliance. Now you're going to say, like many would say, you know, Brian, life sciences, this isn't about money. It's about saving patients' lives. And I would agree. So I'm not saying I've got a value measure that does everything, but I'll say it's necessary. It's necessary to understand the viability of the business. It's the CFO's fiduciary responsibility to know what's happening in the viability of the business. Kaplan and Norton back in the Balanced scorecard was a big deal. I think it was in the 80s, but I loved one of their statements. What you measure is what you get. And then you got to measure impacts to cash flow. And there's an easy way to do that. If you talk to Warren Buffett, if he, how he values a business, he says cash flow is king. When you talk about intrinsic value, when you measure the value of a business, it's looking at its cash flows over time. That's how he does it. The business has to be viable so you can employ so you can do com community support, so you can participate in sustainability, so you can do great things for the community. If the business isn't functioning profitably, you don't get any of that stuff. So as a necessary requirement, we're just gonna go look at cash flow, and we can add other measures too to your risk management. When you're talking about the impact to lives, I use a measure called quality adjusted life years. I'm not gonna talk about that more now, but that's a really nice measure when you're starting to talk about impacts uh, to patients. All right, so I'm gonna use this thought in risk management. Tipping point, material consequences. Tipping point is something occurs and it's like a set of dominoes falling and everything's okay until you get to the red domino. And if the red domino falls, I have material consequences. Simple example, let's say we're worried about earthquakes. All right. You say we have a risk that we're going to have an earthquake. There's not enough clarity on that statement. An earthquake is only going to do damage if it hits a certain level on the Richter scale or another scale. There's other scales you use. And it depends on the building structure you have and how far you are from the ep epicenter. So the tipping point of a material consequence would be an earthquake, tipping point, earthquake, within five, and the epicenter is within five miles of the site, and it hits a Richter value of 6.5 or more, let's say. That's the tipping point. If it gets that big, we have material consequences. Stuff may be on the floor, the plumbing and the ceiling may break, uh, the inventory might be falling off of pallets, that type of thing. All right, so we need this notion of tipping point, a lot of clarity on that, spend time on that, and then talk about what are the material consequences, which are going to be uncertain. Let me take you back. I'm just, we're going to do a thumbnail kind of thing on this. Let's talk about something that a lot of you perhaps concern yourself with or run into it. Risk assessment, stock out resulting from a delayed tech transfer. We start off by framing. I'll show you a tool in a moment how to frame. And here's the short story. Concern over the CMO's ability to complete the tech transfer on schedule. We already built up a six month safety stock into the overall tech transfer, right? Just in case, just in case I got an additional six month safety stock. But recently there's been an uptick in demand on the product that coupled with the delayed tech transfer could result in a stock out. And unfortunately, this is the type of drug that 
uh, if a physician, if you're, if it's not available, it's something that the physician can substitute something else for uh, and change the prescription. And what happens then? Once you change the prescription, some of those might come back in future sales, but you're going to lose a big chunk of those as well. A big chunk of those will go away forever. So how do I get this tipping point and that notion of a probability? Well, in this case, we got together, got in a room, had folks from commercial, had a bunch of different functions of the company together. And we talked about the scenario that would get you to such a delay that would eat through that additional six month safety star. And we had the conversation and came up with, well, it looks like about a 40% chance we could get into that scenario. 40%, is there some probability out there that's the true probability of this? There's not. The probability represents our collective understanding, our best wisdom on how likely this is going to occur, this risk, the stock out. One of the things we always do is we'll look at the sensitivity of this probability number to how valuable, how big the risk is, how valuable it is to mitigate it. A very useful sensitivity analysis. So given we have a stock out, we could potentially lose up to six months of sales, and that's about 200 million that year, and 50% of those customers' sales indefinitely. It's actually going to be a range of loss that we'll talk about. I won't go into that, but we'll use a narrative. Surprisingly bad scenario. This is what happens. This is how long the stock out is. Surprisingly good scenario. And then a 50-50 scenario. We only need three scenarios to get all the information we need to do the right correct uh, mathematics. Risk mitigation plan. Well, we're going to hire an outside contractor. It's going to cost us about 300,000 over the next 18 months. We're going to put that person in the plant. Uh, we're actually going to add some additional equipment at the CMO to expedite the test batches, get off their production line. So we're going to chip in that actually the CMO. We're actually going to pull forward some additional safety stock and we're going to ask the executives to manage down a little harder on that CMO. We don't want this stock out to occur. So that's the whole nature of the mitigation plan. How long did it take to have this conversation? You know, we spent an hour and a half with a group of people just trying to frame that risk. We haven't captured all the numbers we need yet, but we framed it. And we framed it with something simple like this, just a pretty easy template. Risk frame equals tipping point and the impact narrative, what happens if it occurs. So tipping point of a material consequence, that was that a delay that eats through the safety stock leads to a stock out. That's the thing we're talking about. And there's a probability. No investment in action. Hey, if we let it ride, we're just gonna assume the risk. I wanna understand how big the risk is to us. So there's some probability of that occurring. And then we just have impacts. Just these are just check the box. What should be in the narrative? Is there a regulatory compliance issue we should talk about? Yes or no? I'll check a box. Is there potential less sales? Oh yeah, I'll check that box. How about additional cost involved? Yeah, there's some additional costs we're going to have to account for. Are we worried about patient safety here in any way? No, it's not really a patient safety issue. There's not an employee safety. It's just a check, you know, let, what's the nature of the conversation, all right? Now, down here, this is the decision point. If we do act, what would we do? Risk mitigation plan. And I just described to you a risk mitigation plan. It was about $650,000 we're going to spend if you add it all up. And if we go with the mitigation, does that probability of a tipping point change or not? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So we're going to create these narratives on the impacts, I'm not gonna go into detail on that, just give you a notion, now we'll talk about surprisingly bad scenario, using these elements here to describe what happens, surprisingly good, 50-50. And that'll be the whole conversation. I've taken something, we probably spent, it depends on how many people are involved, but you know, we might've spent up to six hours now getting, what we need to do an analysis. Not a lot of effort here. And that's the beauty, I think, behind the particular approach. I'm just going to show you what comes out. If we, we could do that much work and do some analytics, this is a particular tool that we use. It's called Pro Prospector. 
Uh, these are just steps that we're filling out, probabilities, incremental impacts, how much you're spending. But I, I'm just going to jump here. What am I looking at if, it, if we work this out? Before investment in action, these are thousands of dollars expected. I'm looking at the expected net present value, the present value of that risk liability, today's dollar of the enterprise. And it turns out if you let this ride, you're sitting on about $142 million in risk. All things in accounting for the probabilities, accounting for the scenarios, accounting for everything that we need to account for to do a, a proper uh, probabilistic analysis. But you're sitting on $142 million risk. If you do pursue it, we can whittle that down to about a $36 million risk. So we're taking a pretty good bite out of it. Got some other measures here I'm looking at. I'm just trying to take your eye to what's important what I look at quickly. So we'd say this $142 million risk, we can reduce it to about a $36 million risk if we spend about $650,000. That's interesting. What kind of return is that? I wanna know, you know what, what do we get in, ter in terms of return? Uh, there is a measure here we're gonna use, it's called investment productivity. And let me explain that to you. So you put that all together and I've got a productivity Investment productivity, 167. What does that mean? It's a dollar for dollar comparison. So it means for every dollar we spend of that 650,000, every dollar of that creates or protects in today's value of the enterprise, $167. It's a huge return on investment. We wouldn't know it if we didn't measure it. So Short of this type of analytic, I just don't know the kind of gain that you're going to get from spending on risk, something that's, that, that's missing in, in organizations. Well, that's interesting. What about all these other ones? There's other, there's other problems, risks, and opportunities competing for resources too. So what do we do if we look at a set of these? Well, we've got a nice little chart. It's going to be pretty simple. What we're going to do is take all one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, whatever, pro items. And the first thing we'll do is we're just gonna rank order them by their productivity, investment productivity. I'm rank ordering from highest productivity to least. And I want you to look at something in here, the range and the values, 167. Next one's $54 per dollar. Next one's 32, 20, 12, single digits. One, negative, it's not worth the spend. The, just an incredible range of value in here that you wouldn't know unless we measured it, okay? So you can imagine going back and saying, hey, let's, I'm not sure about the numbers that went into your analysis, Brian, let's redo stock out, I got a different probability. And in instead of 167, I'm, it might be, yeah, okay, it's 123, it's not negative. It's a lot more than 54, it's not single digit. So if we just get close to getting these in the shooting match, collecting all of our wisdom together, all of our knowledge, subject matter experts, what happens is you'll get a pecking order and chances are they'll be spread so great that even if we start changing numbers and relationships, very often the priority, the sequence doesn't change. That's a powerful statement to make. Okay, meaning we can do a lot of sensitivity. And unless we're just way off on something, we better check. We don't want to be. These things are going to lay out in, a, in an order. So what I have is this list is ordered. Now all I'm going to do is I'm going to accumulate how much we're spending as we add in each pro item. And I'm accumulating how much we're creating or protecting value. A little bit like a ben, Benjamin Franklin statement, penny saved, penny earned. A dollar protected for the enterprise is just as valuable as a dollar created for the enterprise. So if we just funded the stock out resulting from delayed tech transfer, it's cost us $650,000, $650, pardon me. And we're gonna protect about 106 million in value. If I add in the second, go to the clinical hold, and you know we're gonna fix that problem. You're gonna add in, we're gonna be at a total of about $6 million and now we're creating or protecting up to about 400 million. So I'm just ordering these things. And if you were to draw a line, I'm not just, I'm just drawing a line here. That's up for discussion. 
you'd see if I funded everything north of 10, we were asking for about 30 million, but we're creating or protecting over 800 million today's value for the enterprise. That's incredible return on investment. So what happens, if, that's nice to see it in the table for explanation, what's even better I think is a graph, a graph that shows this nice, you know, as a mathematician economist, beautiful diminishing return curve. It's always shaped something like this. What I'm doing is I'm adding up the investments here. I'm gonna accumulate the value we have. And there's a net present values. We're gonna first fund the stock out risk. And then the second one, the clinical hold. And you can see this thing starts to bend down and if we spend about 30.6 million, we're creating protecting about 800. This was an interesting chart. Way out here at the end is this single stock out, single source stock out risk. And here's what happened. The executive said, you know, Brian, I don't care it's negative. I want to second source that. And I said, that's perfectly fine. You're the decision maker. We're going to call that a must have. The must haves come off the top of the budget we put them at the front end of the spend, and then this curve just moves to the right. So it's a great conversation. This doesn't dictate what you decide, it's just informing, and they want the second source. We say, fine. You can think of compliance issues, safety issues. A number of issues come in, you just say, hey, I don't really care about the financial aspect of this. We have to do it. We call it a must-have, goes to the top of the budget, and things that are spent afterwards compete against each other, I'd say based on that curve. So this is, uh, some call this the silver bullet slide. This is a great slide for decision making. So I'm gonna say, I was an executive. I had monthly meetings, semi-annual meetings, weekly meetings. I'd say, you know something? I want you to answer five questions for me. All I want, to, I want you to be able to answer five questions for me as you manage your project, as you manage your organization, as you manage your plant, as you manage your strategy. I got five questions. Manage any project function organization, five questions. I'd say number one, you should know what your pro items are. First thing you got to tell me, I'm the executive. What's your pro item list? I want to see what's on your list. Just the list. Second question. I have. Which are of the most value if not pursued? I'm back to cognitive dissonance. You know something? We hate loss. Our disdain for loss is much greater than our desires for gains. It's the nature of who we are. It's actually the nature of mammals. We share that with all other mammals. We hate loss. Gains are great, but we hate loss more. So the second question is, where do I get beat up? Where could I get beat up the most? Where could we get beat up the most, the enterprise? Second question. Third question, which if pursued, that is we put resources against the problem, risk, or operator, which create or protect the most value? Some risks you could spend a lot of money on and not mitigate any of the risk. We need to know how well, how far we move the needle on value. And that's the third question I'd want to know. There's actually software that answers each of the questions. That's what software actually's job is to answer these questions. But I'm saying this is what I think the process should be, short of any application. Fourth question, what should you pursue at this point in time? And that's the productivity curve I just showed you. It's a great graphic for question four. My last question for my team, folks reporting to me. Fifth question, what are the implications to your plan and budget? What did this just mean to your plan and budget? How much ris residual risk do we still have given we do these things? How much opportunity are we still leaving on the table? So I would say if I'm looking at an organization, I'd integrate these questions into the process. You never tear the process up. Surgically put these questions in and ways to answer that into your operations. That's what we do. And we have some analytics to help that happen, okay? So knowledge about risk is only informative, meaningful, and useful if it supports making a decision. That's my view of it. That's what risk management is. It's a decision-making process. If it, does, if it doesn't, if it doesn't inf well inform decision-making, you're missing something. So I'd say we need to reframe current risk management methods 
to ensure risk-based decisions can compete with decision-making for problems and opportunities. That's what it boils down to. I've got five questions. Know your pro items. We have an efficient way to frame, do an analysis, get to a return on investment. If we want other measures, we include the other measures that your organization wants, but we should have this measure in your set of measures that you're using. I'm gonna turn this back to James and he's gonna talk a bit more about where this fits in and other things that we do, but I appreciate you listening to the conversation, presentation. I'm looking forward to the questions too. Thanks, Brian. And uh, I'd like to get through this so we can get to the questions, but uh, what Brian was talking about really can happen at any stage of the product um, or company life cycle uh, and, and can be beneficial. And the types and natures of issues uh, that you can address uh, can change. Uh, there's a number of ways to get started. Uh, some organizations may have a portfolio of risks they know already and need assistance with that. Um, others may need a gap assessment where they don't know what that portfolio is and they need uh, consulting experts uh, such as the Winshire Group uh, to work with uh, people like Brian to, to really assess that and help help the organization. So um, anything else you wanna say on that, Brian, and we can get to the questions? No, I'm a, thank you for that. And yeah, I'm, I'm definitely up for questions. Okay. No, I'm not. I was gonna say, well, we can trans open, transition over uh, to the Q&A part. Again, if you have a question, you can submit it um, by the chat bar or the Q&A um, icon. Um, I'm gonna skip over to a first one that I saw uh, come over and that's, um, how do I know implementing this will benefit my organization? Uh, could you describe a case study? Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, here's, here's a very interesting case study. So uh, you remember Hurricane Her uh, Maria back several years ago. Uh, we were looking at a site in Puerto Rico about eight months before Hurricane Maria hit. And the, the discussion was, um, should we ruggedize this roof? We're a little worried about this. We've had some problems with it. We actually, we've got inventory in there. It's a lot of value that's underneath this. Should we, um, should we ruggedize that given all the other requests for capital? We looked at it, productivity was really high and uh, said, yeah, let's ruggedize it. Well, you know where I'm going with the story. <laughs> Hurricane Maria comes through the building standing. There was a lot of destruction in Puerto Rico. In fact, this particular company ended up supporting much of the island. They were so well prepared for this. But we didn't lose anything in that building nor on uh, other buildings up with uh, lesser structures. So the executive, I, I liked it. He said, you saved our bacon on that one. So, you know, that's a story. There's a lot of things that you'll spend money on risk that, that won't mitigate something. But the whole, the game of risk management is making sure that these most significant ones that you mitigate how they impact you. So that was a great process. We did get to something that needed to be done and it happened to be very timely. Uh, that particular company is, you know, has over 800 applications of looking at things uh, through this particular lens. That's a great question, thank you. Okay, uh, let's see, I have another one. And I see, um, so what is the easiest way to get started? Brian, um, the last slide up. I'm sorry, Brian, could you put the last slide up? Thanks. Yes, I'll, I absolutely can. I'm sorry, I have, I took it out of slideshow just so I can see what's going on. And I'm gonna go back to this. If you announce the questions of this will work. Yes, James, you wanna, did you wanna talk to this or? No, the last slide, Brian, thanks. The, the last slide, this slide. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, yes, of course. Um, so, you know, what usually happens getting started, you know, what's best to do, take something that's meaningful to you right now, something that's real, maybe an issue, two, maybe three, try it out, try it out, work with us, we'll frame it with you, you know, in the end, it's something that you could do on your own, but you're not going to understand how to frame, so we're going to frame it. Uh, that particular issue that we're looking at, do the analysis. Uh, one of the questions always for me in my head is how much granularity does, do you need or the executives need 
to feel comfort with comfort and satisfied with an analysis. And what happens usually is at the beginning, we want lots of details. We're trying to understand, make sure it works. But after over time, what you begin to realize, you'll just learn that there isn't great details we need to get to the right answer, to get to an investment productivity. So over time, what'll happen is you'll learn how to play more efficiently and we don't have to put in as many details as you think. So I think just getting started would be try it out, work together, see what, see how, uh, how it works out for you. I'll guarantee you, you're gonna get some insight there's, you wouldn't have otherwise. I don't know how else you'd get to these insights, this quality of insight short of what we're talking about. Thanks, a great question too. Yeah, I, I agree, Brian. I think if you have a portfolio that you know you need help with, uh, quickest way or easiest way to get started is give us a call. And we're happy, it, it'll be a fun experience. I guarantee you that it'll be efficient. Uh, we'll learn a lot together. It's not gonna be a long drawn out thing. It's gonna be a cut to the chase activity. And then you may learn, hey, we, we like this. We'd like to adopt this methodology um, going forward as an organization. Absolutely. Or use it on a, you know, as needed basis. It's whatever, whatever works for you. We're, we're happy to support you in any way we can improve your decision making. Uh, I do have another uh, great question. So this person said that they're already stretched. Um, really thin now. <laughs> Their plates are qu quite full. Uh, they're a small company. So um, how would it be beneficial for them to implement this approach? Yeah, that's, that happens all the time, doesn't it? So, you know, we work with startups to, you know, multinational Fortune 200, Fortune 100 companies. And so you got to right size it. I would say in a startup situation where you are stretched, you're going to want to leverage our skill which would always be the case. And in this framing, we just have some questions. It's a conversation we'll have, it's a narrative. We'll have a conversation. We're gonna ask for some numbers, not a lot. It's not a very big effort. Definitely at your end to get started. It's not that type of process. The onus is on us to use our skill in framing and to analyze and to ask for just the information we need, just the right amount. It won't be detailed. So. I, I joke with people. I'll say, you know something? We can do any one of these in four, you know, in a, in a half hour if we want. And I got called on that in a company once. We were in a meeting and they said, oh yeah, we just did a, they did a six month, listen, a six month analysis, big model, big complex model, looking at something. And yeah, he said, you can do it in 30 minutes. And I looked over at the sponsor and I didn't want the, the answer she gave me. She said, yeah, let's try it out. Oh, great. All right. <laughs> Let's take a shot at this. 40 minutes later in that meeting, starting from scratch, hold up the software, ask some questions. I said, okay, on this particular decision, I'm, we're ready to go. I've got some results. And they said, um, you know, they had this big cumulative distribution and a nice shape and anything. And on that distribution that was most important, there's a 90th percentile number and a 10th percentile, which I get to too. And we looked at those numbers and they weren't very far off. I mean, less than like four to five percent difference. Wow. The tails of the distribution, we did it in 40 minutes, starting from scratch, and there's 12 people in the room. And I, you know, I brushed my bra, you know, I, uh, I, I slept well that night. That was, that was tough to do, but we did it. And the idea is we can do things quickly, we can always take a first quick look and say, does it merit additional analysis? And the answer might be, uh, yeah, that's a little loose. I don't know if I trust that, but we can get to a productivity number quickly by doing something like that. So uh, yeah, we can go quick. It's all up to you. We're ready to go as fast as you want. If it needs to be drawn out and there's many more people involved, then we'll involve the people. We gotta bring people along for the ride. It's all about aligning stakeholders to a decision. It's not just some analytics. The process has to align the stakeholders to the right, to the conclusion and enable them to make a decision that they're confident in. That's our job, okay? And you can, we could go through all of this and you decide to do the exact opposite. And all I can say is we've done our job. We informed you. 
for ulterior reasons, you might decide to do something else. And that's perfectly fine. But we've informed you on what looks like best for the enterprise. Our job's over. You make the decisions. If you've got additional questions, we're going to answer those too. Make sure that you make a high quality decision. And Brian, you touched on it earlier in the conversation, but what I find most beneficial about the tools uh, is they help you organize your thinking and they help people, uh, different parts of the organization get on the same page. There's tremendous value right there um, with, with these tools like analytical hierarchy process. I know you're familiar with that tool. It's another decision-making tool. Um, yes, absolutely. It's, you know, it's, it's transparent. It makes it transparent to everybody. Here's why we're choosing this. Here's why we are not choosing this. And that's important, why we're not choosing something else. Someone thinks the right thing to do. And we're saying, here's why we are not doing that. It's, uh, and you still might disagree, okay? But it's been transparent, okay? And, and everybody understands why. And we can make it a process. We can make it a repeatable process. And we can make it a very efficient, readable, repeatable process. Great value in that, I think. Any other questions? I think we're actually getting close to, to the end of our time together today. <laughs> um, but thank you again, Dr. Higgin, for joining us and for our attendees uh, for spending your time with us this morning. Um, I also just want to let you know that we will um, have this webinar available. Um, I will send it out to a link to you, and we'll also have it up on our uh, web um, our website. Um, soon, Winshire.com will let you know when that's up and, and ready and you can share it with um, your decision makers as well. <laughs> um, we will have a, um, another webinar coming up um, in November. We'll be talking about lab, uh, lab startups, so stay tuned uh, to those details. And uh, again, thanks everyone for, for coming. Uh, that will conclude our webinar for today. Well, Jen, I just encourage anyone who uh, you know, has any more questions or like to talk to us more, our contact information is here. Uh, please reach out. We'll get you in touch uh, with Brian and we can get started. And again, thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thank you very much, folks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.